Hi there. I'm a host, Carter Umhow, and before we begin today's episode of The Appetite, I'd like to let you know about an event happening at Opal on January 11th. It's a coach's workshop called Creating a Healthy Sports Culture, Facilitating Athletes' Positive Relationship with Food, Body, and Exercise. This is a workshop that's going to be helpful for really anybody that works with athletes in a professional setting, and it's going to be happening at the University of Washington. So make sure you check out opalfoodandbody.com slash event in order to find out more. We'd love to see you there. Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle, Washington. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist, artist, and writer. And today we'll be talking about runner Mary Kane, who at just 17 was a distance running phenomenon. That is, until she was recruited by Nike's elite running team called the Nike Oregon Project. There, she was coached by Alberto Salazar, who Kane says constantly berated her around her weight, asking her to become thinner and thinner and thinner, all under the guise of improving her performance. She recently wrote a New York Times op-ed about how the win-at-all-cost culture destroyed her running career and her body and led to disordered eating and even suicidality. This is a subject that is particularly important to Opal co-founder and exercise and sports director, Kara Bazzi, who is here to talk with us about Mary's story and others. Our hope today is to both dissect what's super toxic about current sports culture while also offering a bit more hope around what coaches and others that work with athletes can do to really transform the culture at play. Without further ado, hi, Kara. Hi. I have to just say... This talk that we're hosting, we made the decision to do this before the article came out with Mary Kane. Oh, cool. So it's synchronicity. I mean, I can't even believe the timing of it. So I'm very excited that this was already in the works and we're co-hosting it with the University of Washington C- Center for Athletic Leadership. And so I'm I, I'm beyond happy with the timing. So good. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mm-hmm. would imagine that a lot of listeners have no idea what article you're referencing. Yes. Uh, maybe some do. Maybe we have a lot of listeners. Um, I know that we do that are athletes. But can you offer a bit of a summary into what has been going on in yes. media right now yes. around distance running? Yes. So this is, it's <laughs> my body has been buzzing for about two weeks around this because this is a really big deal. One, because the article that Mary Kane and video that she came out with came through the New York Times front page online. And so that means that this has reached a way broader audience than than a lot of media has. And people are listening. And in response to Mary Kane's... So Mary Kane basically came out about... Um, her experience running for the Nike Oregon Project and for from her coach, Alberto Salazar. And who was Mary Kane? Mary Kane was a high school phenom distance runner. So she um, was successful really young before puberty. And Alberto Salazar recruited her, I believe, the summer after her sophomore year of high school. And so then she ran for him professionally in the Nike Oregon Project along with her counterparts that were actually much older. She is now, I'm trying to think, I, I believe she's now 23 years old. And so she hasn't been running for the Nike Oregon Project for a little while now. But in some of her interviews, she states that she decided to come out about this after Salazar has already um, gotten into trouble about doping practices. So he was already suspended as a coach. And that experience prompted her to consider bringing him off of the pedestal and really seeing her experience for what it was. And then she's taken the incredibly, incredibly brave step of putting this out into the world beyond the doping concerns. She's bringing out um, the way he treated her around weight and actually around her emotions, her emotional experiences and weight and, and speaking very directly about the abuse that she suffered. Because of that, other athletes from the Nike Oregon Project are coming out and sharing their experiences and corroborating some of the information she's um, given, both of, of watching his practices around Mary Kane, but also their own experiences with Salazar. 
and that it's illuminated this this issue from a, even a much broader perspective outside of outside of Nike and really looking at the sport of distance running as a whole and questioning kind of what have been the practices and where have we been doing young athletes harm. Again, my bo- my body's buzzing as I'm even talking about it because this has been something that's been a passion area of mine since, I mean, for 20 years, um, since my own personal experience in distance running when I was in college. My experiences in college is what dictated my career path to even come to the place of, of being a, a co-founder of Opal and creating the exercise and sport program, um, so much related to the fact that this is not something that I believe is done well in sport culture around athletes' relationship with their uh, bodies and with nutrition and weight and performance. So for Mary Kane's story in particular, we've got someone that was, wasn't she the, the fastest woman in the world at one point? Well, uh, the young, uh, yeah, the in terms of her age and kind of her potential okay. for for being, uh, she was the hi- fastest high school high school runner. Okay, so yeah. hugely successful, and she then joins this team, yes, of a superstar coach, yes, and is with the Nike Oregon Project, right. which I'm assuming is. A the elite of, of the elite. The elite of the elite. Okay. Right. Promoted and with a stamp of Nike all over it. The, right. The like kind of biggest, best right. athletic related company in the world. Yes. Right. So she is in this situation and as she's trying to train and become even better, mm-hmm. the emphasis constantly is on you need to be smaller. You need to lose weight. You need to lose weight. You mm-hmm. only will be better if you lose weight. So she tells her story and talks about the beginning wasn't like that. She actually had a string of success. She talks about part of the part of her journey where the weight piece came in and the biases and beliefs of Alberto Salazar that weren't founded in any type of science. She she states that he said that she wasn't fit enough for a particular race. And in in athlete language, that was that she was she was too fat, that she had to be thinner. And again, other athletes have come out saying he he was pretty weight obsessed, weight focused. Um, and he had very strong beliefs about a particular race weight was necessary to perform at peak performance. And so the culture at Nike was that everybody had their kind of race weight that they had to make. He treated all athletes the same. He treated male athletes the same, female athletes the same, and Mary Kane, who was an adolescent, which is very concerning to have. I mean, it's concerning on all levels, but she wasn't even through puberty yet and still had a race weight that he wanted her to be at. But the the thing that's been a, under a lot of scrutiny has been the um, ways coaches are approaching the weight piece when it comes to a sport like distance running, where weight has relatability to sport performance. But I think, I mean, this is, again, an area that I've been very passionate about around educating coaches because like the the manner in which you address weight for an athlete is, is very critical um, in how if you are supporting somebody towards the path of an eating disorder or whether you're supporting them to be a healthy athlete. Can you describe what the maybe more ideal language would be? Yeah. So it's interesting because I think one of the unfortunate pieces that isn't I haven't heard in, in the podcasts that have come out yet or in the articles that have come out yet is thinking about weight as as we would in our world at Opal with a health at every size lens as separating weight from health. So to take this into a sport context, separating weight from sport performance. And what I mean by that is I think a better approach for coaches is to focus on the athlete's health and thinking about health coming first, which involves a whole piece around nutrition, sleep, rest, recovery, training, and having the weight be secondary And so especially, I think, for a growing athlete, a developing athlete, an athlete who is in puberty, I don't think there should be any, any any reason or any time that you are having a goal of a particular weight where somebody has to lose or gain weight to get to that goal, unless somebody has, unless somebody's in a restrictive food place and they're having to gain weight from an eating disorder. But from a strict standpoint of... Uh, weight and performance, I don't think there's any time or reason you would do that for a developing athlete. 
And so what I believe really is key for coaches is that that weight piece is secondary. The way I'm hearing how Salazar's approach this and how other coaches have approached it is very robotic. And it's, I just don't think it's the way our bodies work. Bodies do different things with our practices around exercise and, and nutrition. It's not a guarantee that you even restrict calories and then your body will drop weight. Your body can may drop weight. It may stay the same. It may gain weight. And so this idea or this notion that we can kind of play God on our body and, and make it reach a particular weight is very destructive. That's a very destructive belief to put out there for athletes, especially because if they don't make weight, what does that do psychologically? They think they've failed. And then there's that whole spinning of what that does to break down the athlete's mind and their psychology that also impacts sport performance. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, something that I heard Mary Kane say in the New York Times video about her. Mm -hmm. There was a particular race with the, where she, when she was on the starting block, she already knew that she was she had lost. And exactly. Because psychologically, she hadn't made weight that day, this arbitrary weight that the coach had given her. And so she was already in a mindset of total, complete failure right. based off of that. And there was no race to run after that, basically. Right. And I've heard that from athletes that I've worked with that have been coached by other people, right? If you are going to tell an athlete that your ideal racing weight is this exact number, there's a psychological component that's called <laughs> belief and placebo effect. Mm -hmm. So they can actually race poorly, not because of their weight, but because they don't believe in themselves and they don't believe the coach believes in them. And so they can already be going to the starting line feeling like a failure, and that will be reflected in their sport performance. So the fact that it's being presented as it's the weight's fault for a, for a lack of sport performance is false, and it's really destructive and damaging. Sport performance is a very complex and nuanced, and psychology is a part of it. And, and the belief we have in our own ability and our confidence is a huge part of whether we succeed or not as an athlete in a, in a sport competition. So it is it just causes a lot of harm to have that type of approach for weight and performance, especially when it comes to youth, youth athletes you know, and uh, athletes, kind of high school athletes, maybe this is not a time at all to have any conversations about weight. Um, and then there's some dialogue around, but when it comes to elite athletes and that sector of particular people, that might be a time that there is some some pay attention paid to weight. And we they call that periodization in sport where somebody can, during their training or racing season, for example, in distance running, um, there might be a season that there is a manipulation of weight to get leaner in order for that during that competition time. And then they kind of eat again with more freedom. They put weight back on throughout the rest of the year. And some athletes have come out in response to um, the Mary Kane article, including Jen Rines, who has talked about that's been her experience that she had a really good experience with kind of this this weight component, body composition, and it not developing into an eating disorder, her being able to do that in a quote-unquote healthy way. And she had not felt um, – she had an experience of having coaches who have weight shamed her. And so she wanted to give an alternate perspective, which I completely appreciate. I think it's really neat that she wants to create some diverse dialogue around this. You know, Jen was talking from her – her own personal experience. And one of the th reflections I had when I was reading her article was that she is in a unique category. She had kind of some of the, I, I believe, some of the foundational pieces of competencies around food in order to practice what I would call instrumental eating during her her racing season so that when she was doing this instrumental eating and doing a little different manip like attention and manipulation around it it did not trigger eating disorder psychopathology so the 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 reason that's really important to name is there's i don't i think there's a small percentage of people that could do that in a way that doesn't trigger eating disorder psychopathology and you have to be working with people that ha are really educated around eating disorders and nutrition and this whole psychology piece of it to really know whether you're entering into that type of approach to eating 
that doesn't carry the risk factors of then developing an eating disorder. Because unfortunately, I mean, we kind of talk about it, you're playing with fire at that point. If you are doing some manipulation to make a weight for a sport, there are so many people that are going to be at risk. That's going to be a risk factor to then develop an eating disorder. And then you're kind of on this other path where you're, I mean, a lot of these athletes have dropped off and haven't been able to sustain themselves in sport. And that's another piece that I just think we're doing a disservice to the athlete population because in sports nutrition, it's so much more talking about the what of eating versus the how of eating. And we're not talking about the, the relationship and the how of eating that is integral integral with all of this because that is a huge component of disordered eating um, is is the attitudes, the mindset. I mean, you've heard in this podcast, if you've listened to other episodes, there's so much about that component of it. And so I believe that if we were able to bridge the two worlds of some of this eating disorder knowledge and eating competencies into kind of the typical sports nutrition of the what and the timing and the kind of the macronutrients that the body needs along with these eating competencies, yeah. we would be serving our athletes well. And those, for anyone listening that wants to learn more about those, those are Ellen Satter's eating competencies. And nutrition director Julie Church and I did episodes on all of them, mm-hmm. one for each, right. um, to talk about what those are. One of the main highlights certainly being enough food. <laughs> adequate eating is the bottom. They even they have a triangle like Maslow's hierarchy of needs or adequate eating is the foundation. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you can't get instrumental within food unless all of those other needs are met. Mm-hmm. Right. So imagine, you know, you got this high school girl who's coming into this team she has no, I mean, like, I just, she hasn't had the years of all this experience of working with a, a, a dietitian. Um, and Which, by the way, they didn't have a dietitian or a sports psychologist on staff. Not right? sort of. They're, they had their own, they had their staff that they had people to talk to about with nutrition and um, the psychology piece. But then there was all, some, all sorts of concerns about their actual certifications. Yeah, and- certifications, relationships, there wasn't confidentiality, et cetera. So Mary to come into this system. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, I think one of the things with sports is the power structure and a lot of athletes idealize the coach and you know they're they're not questioning a lot of these things because especially in that situation it's it's Nike and the best running program in the country so right. they must have it figured out especially with someone that age that's young right um but we've talked many a times around kind of the identity issues that can happen when an athlete is you know only an athlete right um and that is the only fixture of their identity and right. so if you if you're in that position where your whole world is your athletic performance mm-hmm. and so you're going to be in trouble mm-hmm. potentially to be able to I mean, I mean yeah it takes a lot to be able to advocate for oneself and, and question to, things exactly especially in some system of power and hierarchy and I'm curious too about the gender roles as well right right i think you know, I mean, that was one of the things Lauren Fleshman's come out about is she's really talked about the concern about the the gender piece and how the system is kind of made by men for men. And I, w- I would agree with that. I think that um, not that men can't be incredible coaches. I think there's a lot of incredible male coaches out there. And there's a lot of, um, I would call more masculine approaches to coaching that aren't as effective um, for both male and female athletes. (laughs) Masculine approaches meaning what? Well, I mean, uh, in this case, I mean, one of the one of the things that stands out to me was um, when the, there was a podcast that where Kara Goucher hosted Mary Kane. So Kara Goucher is also a former athlete of Nike Oregon Project, coached by Alberto Salazar. She was actually a big voice um, in the whole process uh, around the doping. She then since got signed with Wazelle, which is a um, company up here in Seattle. And interesting fun fact, <laughs> Kara Goucher, Lauren Fleshman, Amy Yoder, which were all former Oregon Project runners, I ran, I raced against in college. I mean, I would imagine that with there being a personal connection and and having run with these people, you've talked so much about your story, Kara, in terms of um, the very quick. I mean, what I hear as sort of a quick process and beginning to understand and heal from some of the messages that you were getting. Mm-hmm. Obviously. Two decades later, you're still able to kind of be in it and, and think about all the different implications and see 
the mess of it mm-hmm. and learn more, right? But I, I would imagine that to be surrounded suddenly by news oh, um, that's gosh. coming from these voices and these faces and these athletes that were right there with you oh. back then that are now finally saying, wow, this is really screwed. Like this is this is the implication of being here for 20 years and what it's looked like. Yes. Um, I can imagine that contrast would be quite striking for you. Oh, gosh. I am like, (laughs) it is like, thank God it's all coming out now. And I've just been, I mean, I think that's part of the reason I can't stop listening and reading is I just, it's, the voices are out there. And I've been asking myself the question is, is our culture just now ready to hear it? I mean, someone referenced this as the kind of the me too for the sport world. And why do you think that that would be the comparison? I think that culturally, there is more permission for females, especially to voice anger um, in a non-apologetic way. I think that, you know, even uh, Mary Kane had said in her episode with with Kara Goucher that Kara Goucher is she she credits Kara Goucher to coming out because of Kara Goucher's voice with Salazar about the doping. So I think that we're we're borrowing courage from these people before us to say, no, it's not OK. And, and being angry about it. And I was just thinking related maybe to our ep- anger episode, too, is that I think what's so exciting is that anger Anger can start movement. You know, the rage and the and the anger without sugarcoating it, especially, I mean, th- these are not sugarcoated messages that are being put out there. And this can actually, I believe, can affect systemic change. I mean, we're already seeing, I can't believe how many conversations are, that are being had. And are we put out the information about our coaches workshop and one week later, 60 people have registered. Like, I think there is this, um, there's a readiness culturally, in thinking about especially systems of 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 oppression and power of seeing that now you know in in sport and i it's coming out strong in the distance running community and i hope it extends i hope it goes beyond distance running because i i know and have heard countless stories of things and stories of people in other sports too but i am just i am excited and i and i and i feel like the energy I've had this, you know, in the past decade around all of this has been, I want to be part of the solution. I want to be a part of creating education opportunities, access to information for coaches, because I know a lot of coaches are well-meaning. Most of them are not out there to harm. There is just a gap of understanding, I believe. And so I am like, yes, if, if there is an audience, if, the, if there is like more readiness to listen and learn and create these opportunities, I am excited to be a part of it. I, I feel like in all of this, I can see the engagement on all levels of being in my role as, at Opal, being in my role as a, as a therapist with, with our clients, being, being able to teach coaches, do prevention work in the community. I've, I've been coaching basketball. So I've been playing in the role of, of coach of, of young girls and playing around with the concepts of how do we kind of build these athletes up and and support them to be lifelong athletes um, if they choose to and they want to be and not burn them out. <laughs> Being a mom and having my girls now enter into the stage of athletics that does get more serious and it becomes more about performance. Um, so I'm just buzzing there uh, as my girls have started the sport of distance running and, you know, genetic. Medically, they they've got the gift. <laughs> so you know, we're 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 having to engage those systems. And then my husband, who was also at Runner University of Washington, who was recruited by Alberto Salazar um, when we graduated, and said no because he wanted to stay in Seattle to marry me. Um, so go. he did not get coached by him. He ran professionally for a year, got and was the assistant coach at University of Washington, and has has been a coach at um, his old high school. Um, for, since we've been married. So for, for 20 years, he's been coaching. And um, so ha- having the lens of, of his experiences too, um, I just, it feels like it's all over in my life. Yeah, <laughs> It's lit up everywhere. <laughs> it's lit up everywhere. <laughs> so when you talk about like being able to teach and, and hoping for some work that you're able to offer these communities through prevention, mm-hmm. I'm curious about what that looks like in terms of not just preventing eating disorder, but also the burnout that you spoke to. Yes, yes. It's sort of one and the same in yes. some ways, but what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that 
there's a lot of education that needs to continue being put out there. I think one one of the exciting things I'm hearing, because these podcasts and articles are coming from more of the sport world. So I'm hearing people talk about relative energy deficiency in sport and the medical and psychological consequences of inadequate nutrition. Thank God that information is being put out there. Athletes need to know about it. Coaches need to know about it. The risk factors of not having enough nutrition, which is immense. Mm -hmm. And that has evolved. And, you know, we used to talk about the female athlete triad and thank God it's become more comprehensive, more known. What is the female athlete triad? So the female athlete triad was, was the first sort of iteration of what the, the impact on a female athlete of inadequate nutrition, but it was more limited. It was only geared towards women because it was about menses Mm -hmm. and bone health And now this is, thank goodness, it's broader because this inadequate nutrition does not just discriminate towards female athletes. It impacts males. It impacts people of all genders. And so to have clear information about the health and psychological consequences of inadequate nutrition is so important for coaches to have, for athletes to have. And that that information now is being more widespread given what's happened with Mary Kane. And then I think eating disorder and disordered eating in sport is very both normative and hidden. So that is a lot part of my education practices as helping coaches have more attuned eyes on the matter to be able to identify and, and see um, what uh, kind of what is going on with an athlete that might be easy to miss. I mean, yeah. in my sports story, I think I've shared this before, but I had an eating disorder for four years as a college athlete. My coach never said a word. My teammates never said a word. My doctor sev- never said a word, even though I was losing my period. I dropped weight. No one ever said anything. I gained weight. No one ever said anything. I had literally nobody express one ounce of concern in four years. It was my own volition that got me to a therapist finally. I don't individually blame any of those people. It's indicative of a culture that needs to grow and understand what this is. Um, Yeah, and I think that as a (laughs) non-athlete, I feel like I'm often saying that to you. (laughs) As a non-athlete, I think that there's something that is really powerful about these issues coming to light because it seems to me like the athletic world is sort of the one that's kind of been untouchable. Mm -hmm. um, And the idealization of either an athlete's body or their um, sort of optimal health, you know, this sort of idealization of all these different aspects of what it means to be an athlete and what it means in terms of the kind of mastery of their own body is something that I think people look at and want and admire and think, oh, you know, if only I could eat like that or work out like that or look like that. So again, this sort of untouchable space Mm -hmm. has now been kind of blown Mm -hmm. up. (laughs) Well, and when you're idealized like that, as I was in college, I was very idealized by other people, right? Like, what what do you, you know, tell me what you eat, Kara. (laughs) Like, there's all, and no one knew the dark side. I mean, no, I'm not going to tell you how I'm restricting all of my food and I hate myself. And there is such a dark side but that dark side is very difficult to come to the light because mm-hmm. of some of exactly what you're naming, the mm-hmm. idealization, the assumptions. There's a lot of shame involved in that because an athlete can easily say, well, gosh, I have all this privilege. I have everything everyone wants. So why am I unhappy? But guess what? If you're not eating enough, one of the risk factors is depression. <laughs> right. So maybe that's why. And, and Mary Keene talked directly about her suicidality. Yeah. Well, yeah, she yeah, she said that people she was cutting herself and people didn't yes like in front of people yes people didn't say anything and and to and to speak about Horrible. the emotionality piece so she so this is where I was going before with when she was on Carrie Goucher's podcast they both talked about being deemed kind of crazy and it was because they cried because they expressed emotion wow and so again that's where I think there's there can be some of a, a more masculine I don't want to say it's gender because I think there's men that are very good with emotion absolutely but so it is a, a more masculinized trait of don't show emotion motion doesn't have any value or role in this place like buckle down put it away stuff it away mm-hmm. be stoic be a hard ass that's what a good athlete is I fully disagree with that 
And I think it's so unfortunate that that was kind of how both of those athletes were pegged in the Nike Oregon project, that if you're crying, you're crazy. And I'm like, the crying made sense, people. The right. crying made sense sense. There's a lot to cry about. There's a lot to cry about. It's communication. It's emotion is communication. The other piece about the burnout is, and I love this. Um, uh, I got I gotta quote it. <laughs> so Lauren Fleshman, she had a brilliant op- op-ed piece in response to Mary Kane's in the New York Times. And she she writes, there should be a hall of fame that inducts coaches whose athletes have gone on to have the longest careers. I'm like, that, wow. Imagine a culture shift if that was the Hall of Fame qualification. Because I think, unfortunately, (laughs) that's not the case. And you can get you can get an athlete to short term perform extremely well with an inadequate eating, and then you can damage them for their lifetime. So if you if you just cycle them in, Mm -hmm. you can approach it that way. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's that's harm. And so this idea that if somebody wants to be an athlete, what would set them up to be a lifelong athlete? And I think part of that is taking care of themselves and having kind of their their needs met with nutrition and with other parts of their life. And then performance is another big one that I, I, I feel like is really important to put out there because as soon as performance kind of takes precedent over joy – it really can take athletes out. The win at all cost culture, you might get again a short term immediate impact from an athlete, but that's a that is a recipe for burnout. I, that was that was one hundred percent my experience, mm. and I think it's and and thankfully I had kind of the wherewith or the this desire to return both to basketball and to cross country, but if joy is smothered out. That is that is a recipe for saying goodbye to it, mm-hmm. and and sadly the other when we what we hear on the client end of of people in their twenties and thirties is oftentimes they're avoiding all of these forms of movement and sport because they're afraid of not being good at it. Well, why are they afraid of not being good at it? It's not a personal problem. It's because that's what the culture says is important. That is what the culture is valuing. So again, application for a coach if you're valuing that that is the key component. You might not even be saying that winning is the most important piece or that the sport performance is the most important piece. But if you're suggesting it through your actions and your kind of behavior, that that's what you care about, that's going to get translated Mm -hmm. to an athlete. That, That sort of language of actually coming alongside someone into their personal experience and their personal performance Mm -hmm. rather than the, like, when at all costs attitude is, like, a really important distinction. And how do you keep fun and the the pleasure and the joy involved even in the sport? Like, I'm coaching uh, fifth grade girls right now. And of course, you know, they're still in the young age, yet they're in, they're getting to be in the more and more competitive, the desires to, to win and be, be good. And I am intentionally doing things in my coaching that um, supports the notion that there are other parts of basketball that are important to well, to round them out, like connection, like their friendships, like their community. What do you, I want to know like what you actually do do with them. Okay, I can order tell you an example. That. Yeah, like uh, is that like a dr- like are there drills? <laughs> so I do every practice I do what's called a team chat. Okay. So this is kind of something I've been dreaming of when I was ready to get coaching these girls. So every practice and these girls love it. So it's during the water break <laughs> and we actually go outside of the gym cuz the gym's hot and they like to go outside and get some fresh air in their face and we do a team chat. Okay. And the team chat, I've been posing like one question to the girls and then they all get an answer. And then, um, and what kind of questions? so the first question practice one was, why do you play basketball? Cool. And that was like my little mini teaching point was around kind of pleasure and play being a key component of long-term sport performance. And then, um, I think my next one was what makes you strong? And then um, I had them do goal sheets. Well, so separately outside of the team chat, I we did a pizza dinner one night, and I had them do a basketball goal for the season and a relational goal for the season. Cool. And I kind of took them through how to set, like, process-oriented goals. And the relational goals, most of them were about, like, getting to know each other and being connected and maybe having a sleepover. So then oh. now my team chats were every team chat, we're having two girls share five things about themselves that 
it might just be like things that they don't really know about each other. And I'm kind of pushing them to go a little deeper than just surface stuff. So I might pose a couple questions to them. And so then they've each gotten the chance to be known and have their audience outside with their team chat. And it's been just so cool to see this kind of idea work because they're like, can we go to our team chat? Like, they're so excited to go do the team chat <laughs> in the middle of practice. And it builds connection. I'm I'm learning about each of the girls. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling more connected with them with having this knowledge of a little bit more about them outside of basketball. If not, I would just kind of get to know them through the context of basketball, right? So it, it, it builds this idea that you're more than a player. And yet we're putting this in the context of the sport. I wow. It's really fun. Wow. I would have kept playing basketball if that had that had been my experience. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. And we're going to have our team sleepover. Jeez. <laughs> oh, you know, which I could be invited yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a fifth grader. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And I'm also, I think what I'm trying to integrate in the team chat is that each kid's different. So mm-hmm. like even, oh, one of my questions was what makes you feel encouraged? Because I wanted them to see um, that there's always there's differences. Like not every not everyone's one and the same. Right. So I think that's a good learning as in a community conversation to see we're not all the same. Does this translate at all to the way that you then coach? Yeah. Like skills oh, wise, for sure. Or like, yeah. Well, like for example, how are they going to get encouraged? I mean, a lot of them talked about affirmation. Right. Mm-hmm. Affirmation really helps them feel motivated and. And this is uh, another thing where um, that's come out in some of these articles is coaches' styles and motivating athletes and does shaming motivate people? I have a hard time. <laughs> I have a really hard time. Believe- I, I guess uh, like some of the stuff that's come out is like there's a, there's a percentage of athletes that are motivated by shame. I think that's fear motivation again, which is really short-sighted. It's not right. the long game. It's a. It might be effective to get the results you want as a coach because the athlete is actually scared of you. Right. <laughs> in in contrast, with these little fifth grade girls, they kind of talk specific about the ways they like to be encouraged and affirmed. And so I'm totally integrating that in practice. And you can just you can see them light up. And you know what? I'm thinking about myself as a little basketball player. And I mean, my basketball experience was I loved that. I love that game more than I loved run. I love that game more than anything. And when I had a coach in my high school experience, um, use shaming, use cut downs, I shriveled. And I ended up, I mean, I was a college prospect and I ended up being benched my senior year because I couldn't perform under that. Not every athlete's going to be like me. This The kind of response to that is going to vary. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't. I think there's no reason to shame it. I don't think there's any reason to shame an athlete. Again, I wouldn't go short term. I would never go short term philosophy. I would think about the long game. And I think long term motivation, we're going to be more motivated when we're believed in Mm -hmm. and encouraged. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't remember a lot of the details about this, but I was thinking about the Seahawks Mm. as at their prime. How many years ago as they were taking over all the Super Bowls? There was such a beautiful sort of magic to that team. Mm -hmm. And Pete Carroll was so Mm team-oriented. It was so clear, obviously as a Seattleite, maybe more than in other states, but it was so clear that that was a team-oriented coach that was, yes, getting passionate on the sidelines and, yes, like getting ferocious at times, but was clearly not doing that in this sort of like abusive way. No. angry way. It was about sort of advocating for the team and bringing the team together in some totally. sort of magic. And they were on fire. Mm-hmm. They were so good. Totally. Like I think of even that, that reminded me of something even that I'm can, thinking about while we're coaching basketball is if you have a play to win mentality, you kind of just let maybe the girls that are a little bit more, have a little bit more athletic talent and you just, you know, you'd let them take the shots and kind of help and they would help carry the team around. But I don't, I don't agree with that approach at all because then you're not developing them all. And, and I think that, that at least, (laughs) at least in this little experience of mine as a, as a college or as a coach of um, kids at that, at that age, I would much prefer to spend time developing each one of the players and not just, again, focusing on trying to, you know, the the utmost being kind of winning the game. I mean, sure, it's fun to win. I'm 
I am a competitive person. <laughs> like that is, no, there's no denial of that. But I don't think that that kind of approach is really, again, looking at the long game. Mm-hmm. So Kara, just zooming out again into what's been going on in media and all the different athletes and coaches and people working with athletes out there, I would love to hear kind of what you would have to say to them as we end. There's hope. I feel really hopeful. I feel like this is cracking open something that's needed to be cracked open that's already been there. This is not new. It's just being talked about now. So thank God there's, there's hope for that. And Um, For the people listening to this episode, there are resources. I know I'm just kind of touching some of these topics, um, but there are resources that are out there that we can put in the show notes that are coming out of basic information that is in and of itself is just that will even make changes. (laughs) (laughs) So I think the encouragement is educate, learn, learn more about this. If you are if you are a parent of an athlete, if you're an athlete, if you are in relationship with coaches, if you're a coach, to encourage some of the connection to these resources, to these places of learning, so that we can start shifting the culture and being more educated around uh, weight and performance and how that relates to our athletes. Awesome. Well, we will definitely make sure that we include some links to all sorts of resources in the show notes. But also, if you are in the Seattle area or would like to drive or fly to the Seattle area, (laughs) whatever, um, make sure that you um, look into coming to our January 11th Coaches Talk and Workshop. Again, you'll find some info about that um, in the show notes so you can sign up. Opal is expanding their offering to athletes in 2020 with a new outpatient athlete clinic. So make sure you are following along with Opal on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our newsletter to make sure that you are in the know about what is coming up soon. It's also a great reminder to subscribe to The Appetite on whatever medium by which you are listening um, so you can be up to date on our new releases. Thank you so much to Daniel Gunther at Jextral Cultural Center for Sound Engineering, to Aaron Davidson for the Appetite's original music, and to Hans Anderson for editing. Join us next time. Bye.